Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Creative God. Our whole business is to learn how to obtain a release of the Spirit. I'm convinced that there are many creative energies within us tonight. Praise God. I have a, a subject, and I feel real hope tonight, don't you? Amen. 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 And the Arabs say, he who has life has hope, and he who has hope has everything. And so to us tonight who hope or believe, all things are possible. There's nothing that we need or can need or think we need that we can't have. Praise God. I would like to provoke your faith. I'm still thinking about Enoch. <laughs> I read a paper by John Bouchard, it was very good. He said, uh, we tend to recoil from tribulation. Hallelujah. Let's just, in our spirits, now sit down in the kingdom and relax. One big key and secret to seeing the power of God manifested is to relax. Hallelujah. You know how Tiger Springs? He has been totally relaxed, every muscle of his body. But when he goes into action, he gathers up all his strength and energy, and it's all released at one time. That's what the church needs to do. Gather up all the energies of God. Focus them on one burning issue and let it fly. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. I got a call from Dave Miner last night. Last night or the night before. Asked me to come down. So he was he greeted me with much love and sweetness as is his nature and custom. I feel kind of ashamed I don't show as much affection as a lot of other people. It almost seems one-sided. Well, I just have to make up for what I lack. <laughs> if I like it at all. Or just see through that maybe I'm not demonstrating all that's there. So while we were talking, I just spoke to him and said, God's going to do a new thing. See, there's something brewing in God. The Holy Ghost wouldn't be brooding over us and giving us this warmth if we weren't going to hatch. <laughs> That's what an egg is, it's a seed of life. And the chicken broods over it until it hatches, giving it the necessary warmth. Hallelujah. So, I said, God's gonna do a new thing. And I mentioned old brother Perdina, who heard from God, and when I said that, I was suddenly in the spirit. God's manifest presence was energizing and radiating. So I said a few things to Brother Dave, prophetically. <coughs> I was in the spirit, he felt it on the other end, I know. And the radiant presence of God just began to move and swirl around me. And I heard the voice of God begin to speak, over and over. He said, my power is drawing near, my power is drawing near. Hallelujah. And I can't think the word power or speak it in these last number of months except I have a witness of the Spirit. God's going to begin to exercise his right hand again in the midst of the church. Amen. Hallelujah. He's going to smite the works of the enemy until they're ground to powder. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Many of you are going to see cancers dry up, smitten by the word of the Lord. Amen. I give you hope. We have a lot of things wrong with us here. I sense it very, very acutely. But I'll tell you something else. God's presence keeps visiting me in this place. So I know he's got a purpose and a mind, and he's going to bring it to pass. Amen. I want to give you confidence and tell you in the word of the Lord and in his name tonight, God is going to work. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Brigham Young used to say over and over again, the greatest thing we need is a working faith. They'll never believe, the world will never believe until they see that working faith in operation. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, it seems like I have a hard task trying to say the unsayable or I get so excited when God visits me, I can't set the thing down in real precise formal order. Hallelujah. But anyway, John Bouchard said that the word tribulation means uh, pressure. He gave the Greek word and tell he's been at Bible school. <laughs> Hallelujah. Greek's a beautiful language and very, very precise. There's many subtle shades of meaning. I guess God picked the best vehicle <coughs> available for his expression. And uh, he showed how it was that which presses us to that narrow way, you know, the narrow gate. So what he said there, something had been being provoked in me, and uh, I don't know quite how to get into it. But I, I was thinking about Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 and Jesus learning obedience by the things that he suffered. So, several times lately it's been on my mind to look that up in the concordance, that word suffered. I've heard interpretation, I've heard it preached on, it's quite a prominent scripture. God is making much of certain things these days, are you aware of that? God's talking to us about the things we suffer. He's talking to us about our lives and all the circumstances and all the elements. So I looked into it. This is what I saw. And then this relates to Enoch very pointedly, as we'll soon see, if I'm able to carry through on this. It says in Hebrews 5, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And there contained in that word things was the truth of the John Bouchard was setting forth in his paper that the way to victory is often the very last way we'd ever choose. Do you ever consider that? Now the Bible says Enoch walked with God. He was going somewhere. What's the general tenor of the Bible? Where does God lead men to? Does he not lead them to perfection, to holiness, to power, to victory, to prosperity, to health, to peace? Isn't that the way God led men in the Old Testament? Was that the whole purpose of the law? to order a human society and begin to bless it. And so the law of God or the word of God is not a harsh, unfair imposition upon us like chains around our necks and shackles on our feet. But I believe that the general instructions of the word of God show us the way to the only door of freedom and deliverance that there is, the cross for us now, the Lord Jesus Christ in him. Because doesn't it say, if the Son therefore shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And so here we see him learning the way to this total freedom and deliverance. He's only bestowing on us that which he earned and gained himself. He is giving himself to us. And so it says he learned obedience or an attentive listening, a submission, a compliance. I think I read today in Acts class, the listener in Hebrews chapter in Isaiah chapter 50 where the Lord God wakens us morning by morning to give us a time to learn he opens our ear hallelujah but he learned obedience by the things which he suffered and that word suffered means experience it can be interpreted painful experience but what I most marveled at was that the things were well, not evil things, but this word translated things here means good, that which is intrinsically good. But it does not appear good on the surface. It's not good in the sense of ornamentation or adornment or external appearance. I heard Brother Joe talking about the tabernacle. Two reasons why men don't press to that ultimate holy place, into the very presence of God. First of all, the tabernacle was rough looking, a badger skins on the outside. It did not attract men by the lust of the eyes. You had to have a heart set after God to go in there. And as you go, the way gets narrower and narrower and narrower. Hallelujah. You literally get tribulated into it. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
<laughs> this word tribulation relates as no other word to the modern society we live in. Praise God. Pardon me while I shout. Hallelujah! Glory to God. release of the spirit <laughs> not something that's worked up but something that's crying to get out <laughs> a real anointed shout brings something to birth it brings an element of the glory of God into the real world that needs it the light and the fire and the power and the glory hallelujah 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 <laughs> You know, we're going to revive this church. <laughs> we're going to revive this church of the 20th century. This thing that threatens to die. And revival is a sine qua non of ongoing existence and life. And if it's not revived, it's going to be destroyed. We're going to revive it, I say in his name. We're going to revive it. Hallelujah. How? Through him who said, I am the resurrection and the life. By the word that dwells within us, he said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's only one thing I can do when I've come to this point, and that is to let go what is within me. I can't do anything else. I can't go into a further theological study or apply for interest to Union Theological Seminary. I can't get the world's recognized apostles together to lay hands on me. I've got to give what I've got. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And if I'm going by a beautiful gate and I see a cripple there, and if the urge is upon me, I'm going to look and say, look on me. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory. And such as I have, give I thee. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so this word here, and Brother Joe said, they don't go on to perfection because it's not attractive. And secondly, the price is too great. But because you're already here, and I'm already here, that proves that we've already paid a price. One time I got a ticket onto the train. And I don't know what happened. I, it wasn't the train I wanted, but I got on it anyway. I had to go somewhere. <laughs> Sometimes you don't get on the train you planned in the beginning, but God gets you on the train. Hallelujah. <laughs> I plan to be a prominent evangelist for the big tent. Go out healing the sick and saving the lost and doing great things. And I wouldn't be surprised if it still happens. But I'm not concerned about it tonight. I would be pleased if there were a big tent ministry from Pinecrest that we could go out and pitch the tent and preach the gospel. I believe in all kinds. You know, Paul said praying with all kinds of prayer. When he says all prayer, he means all kinds of prayer. And so I like to see a church working with all kinds of tools. Working through all kinds of channels. Amen. I believe in personal evangelism. I believe in mass evangelism. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe in healing by the gift of healing, where it's gradual. And I believe in healing instantly by the gift of miracles. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's just take the limitations off. Let's pull the stop out. Uh, relax your hands. I heard somebody talking a few days ago that if your hands are relaxed, you're relaxed all over. And you see, many of us have a soul just like our body. We have that, we're clutching something. You know, we're like the little monkey in the jungle. <laughs> the way you catch him is, you take a coconut shell and you hollow it out and you leave a hole in the end about so big. And it's a dried out shell in this hole. Then you put some nuts inside and you set it out in the, bro in the bush. So this little monkey comes along and he reaches both hands in and he fills them up with the nuts. And when he does that, he can't get it back out through the hole again. So then, all you do is walk over and pick up the monkey, kicking and screaming, being careful, careful not to get bit, and you put him in a, in a sack. And he will in no wise ever let go of the nuts. <laughs> Invariably, they clench their fists and hold on to those nuts. And so you just, that's how they catch monkeys. It's real easy. <laughs> now, if you've got your hands into some kind of a trap and clutching something you think you've got to have tonight, if you've got that human clutch that... Dr. Lake used to talk about, I believe it was. Some people are holding on to something so securely they won't let it go. And as long as they won't let it go, it won't let them go either. Right. So they're trapped. 
Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, how sad it is to see God's people get mired with an idea or an ism or a movement or a, a local fellowship or a, a man and they're exalting him and they're just holding on to that thing. And while they're holding on, you're, you're practically spiritually insane. You know, when you're tense, you can't do anything. Yasha Hyphus had to drink whiskey before he went on stage so he relaxed enough to play the violin. He was that scared. And so before you can operate in the kingdom, you've got to relax. <coughs> Jesus says many will come down and will sit down between Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom. He didn't say they'll come and prance and nervous a tick or something like that. He says they'll come and sit down. Hallelujah. Let's come and sit down. When you get relaxed and just let yourself fall back on Jesus' bosom like John did, hallelujah, you might hear him talking into your ear and giving you secrets and revelations, telling you the thing that will solve your problems. Hallelujah. Praise God, and you got problems, hallelujah. <laughs> I hear a problem coming one ear and going out the other all week long. I can look on people's face and it registers problems, problems. <laughs> I see not dollar signs in her eyes, but I see problems in her eyes. <laughs> now, if you don't believe me, I'm no expert. I freely admit it. Ask some of the counselors. Hallelujah. <laughs> Are there any problems with Pinecrest? <laughs> Is there a God in heaven? <laughs> Is he a problem solving God? Well, that word tribulation means pressure. It means to rub. And see, we're rubbing up against each other very, very severely in this place. With much abrasion. Now, this speaks of the truth. The psychologists are finding out about the beautiful people or the, the mass society we live in where we're too close together. Our cities are too big and people live too close together. And what it does, it heats up our psychic temperatures. You see? This is what heat is, it's when the molecules go into greater speeded up activity, and they begin to bombard each other with greater rapidity, then the thing automatically gets hotter. That's what heat is. It's molecular activity. So that's one, that's the, the that's in the very root of this word, tribulation or pressure. It means a rubbing. But what does it do? We look back at Enoch and wonder how he got it start. But I imagine that the Canaanite civilization had got so rough and so evil and so defiling that it was rubbing Enoch the wrong way and it was creating a pressure on his life and the pressure drove him straight into the arms of God because when pressure is upon you, you usually run. How many of you found God while you were running? How many? How many of you found God while you were running? Put yeah. your hands up. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what I say. <laughs> pressure. What does pressure do, this kind of pressure? It imparts a, a psychological energy to you, it puts you in motion. That's how many people react. There's another breed that lie down and get passive. When they do rat experiments with many rats crowded in a small place, there's a certain percentage that just get very fat and beautiful and they just lie down. They lose all their motivation. They become what they call in psychological terms the beautiful people. We have a society loaded with beautiful people now. They're, they dress well, they're sleek and fat, they drive fine cars, but they don't serve any function. They're not loosing the creative energies in the heart of man that, that God put there. So I'm speaking about pressure. It'll get you on the move. Hallelujah. And looking back to Enoch's day, we know there was an evil civilization at that time also. And so it drove him. It doesn't talk about his conversion experience. It says he walked with God. Hallelujah. How quite to get into this, I don't know. But if you look back there, it says Enoch walked with God. Now, Enoch's name contains in it a very germ of thought to narrow down, just like tribulation. First, you in a narrow place. So Enoch was well-named. He was well-named, and he was walking with God in order to get disciplined. But... There's something I want to say tonight that's like a picture that's in my spirit, and I want to bring it forth. It's about Enoch's walk. Enoch walked with God. <coughs> now, we know that God is an absolute. God is the absolute. He's the absolute absolute, right? He's sovereignly absolute, and he's absolutely sovereign. Hallelujah. He is an absolute positivist, and he's positively absolute. 
<laughs> now, if we contain the fullness of God, His absolute word will be here tonight, and we could just begin to speak to all these needs, and they would vanish just like, just like dust before the wind. And we're coming to that. Hallelujah. Amen. I have been on an occasion, a place where the word of God was spoken. I saw tremendous things happen. I've seen people's cataracts let loose of their eyeballs and come right down on their face, on their cheeks. Hallelujah. You never know what God's going to do. We're filled with the wonder of what next in this life and in this walk. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring forth. It could be the greatest meeting with God you ever had in your life. Amen. God is absolute. If only we knew him better. We do know him. But Paul says the ratio is, is, so, is so lopsided. He says, you've come to know God. He says, rather, you are known of God. And our faith and confidence lies in this. Not that we know all about God. We freely confess we don't. But that we know that he knows all about us. Yeah. Hallelujah. And he's working in our case. He has our welfare in mind. Yes. Enoch walked with God. I remember hearing Dr. Baxter on a tape many, many years ago before the charismatics ever existed or they got the idea of listening to tapes. <laughs> I was in a preacher. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I don't like to listen to tapes. I especially dislike listening to my own sermons. But I remember hearing Dr. Baxter, and he was teaching on Galatians. This is where the days when he usually preached, but this was a teaching tape, and a, and a pastor who was a butler disciple had this. I remember one statement the man made. I don't think I remember anything on the tape, but just one thing. Teaching on Galatians. And he said this, Walking in the Spirit solves every problem. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, wasn't that easy for your mind to contain? Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, the working out of it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the God. The working out of that one little phrase would make more books than the world could contain. Because Jesus did so many things being led by the Spirit that John said if they were all written in books, the world couldn't contain the books. So don't worry about whether you're going to have anything to do in Christ or not. He's got a whole cupboard full of activity for you. It's just up to you to discern it and find out what it is and learn how to walk in it. Hallelujah. We're going to flow together as a body. We're going to be so flowing in God one day that it'll be impossible to have a need. Hallelujah. Old Brother Perdina told me that the day that he took a trip in his pickup truck, gone to the feed mill, that the Lord got in the truck. He was invisible, and yet he had mass and weight, and he saw where the seat went down, and he felt the pressure up against his shoulder. The Lord turned to him and said, When my people come to the place that I want them to, they will no longer need to pray, but when the desire enters their heart, it will be granted them. Hallelujah. 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 The glory and the perfection. Doesn't Paul say it never entered the heart of man? Didn't he say that? But he said to, to him and to the others of his generation, God has revealed it by his spirit. We've got to come up in revelation. We're making revelation something that's way up high to be striven. It is not. It's the ground you walk on. Hallelujah. It's the ground floor. There is nobody that's a Christian that's not a Christian by revelation. If they haven't seen Jesus, they're not saved. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before you can ever have faith to receive Him, having receptive faith, you've got to have faith to perceive Him. You've got to have perceptive faith. Yeah. And if you're going to walk with Him, you've got to have retentive faith. You've got to be able to hold to this relationship. Enoch walked with God. So God is there the absolute. He's not qualified, nor can he be qualified. He's independent. He's free. He's free from imperfection or mixture. He's absolute. Amen. Hallelujah. And God, it's said that no man can know God in himself. God qualified himself in coming to this earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and tabernacling among us. Hallelujah. But when you look at those words, Enoch walked with God. There you see Enoch, there you see God, and God was absolute. Well, what was Enoch? Enoch was relative. Hallelujah. <laughs> Everything, I believe, philosophically, could be stated to be relative to God. Am I right? right. Yeah. Now, in this external realm, the only absolutes we know is length and mass and time. 
And science talks about absolute zero, which is minus 273.16 centigrade. Isn't it interesting that all the absolute we can get a hold of is all down on the negative side where it's real cold? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> we have no idea of absolute heat or life or intensity. We have no estimate. We know that there are temperatures of 5 million or more degrees in the sun and that there are stars hotter than the sun, so we can only guess. But they know where absolute zero is, but they can't attain it. Because absolute zero is when all heat ceases to be. And heat is molecular activity, and the motion of the atom and the molecule constitutes the life of inorganic matter. See, everything has a life. Where there is no life, there is no being. In the Hindu conception of God, the God who stands behind all things, that which we would call the transcendent aspect of God, to him they don't even attribute existence. And so we would know nothing of God except he had given us this revelation through godly men by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. And when we read this, it points us to the Lord God Almighty. Anybody who ever picks this book up with a, with a freedom, and that's the problem about religion because it binds you and you can't pick the Bible up without reading it with preconceived ideas and interpretations. And so be standing between you and the Lord of the Word is your theological interpretation, which is an opaque veil that man cannot see through or penetrate. Yes. Right. So if God is absolute and Enoch was relative, then what's that mean? I'm thinking of an old song that used to be a Negro quartet, and they sang it. God is my father, Jesus is my brother, and the devil's no relation at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't quibble with it. It's just put in a very colloquial manner. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so here we find Enoch being the relative. Hallelujah. In other words, they were in a kind of a relationship. Anything that's dependent on something else is a relative, <coughs> which you'll know after you get married 20 years hence and your brother-in-law moves in on you. <laughs> Say seven years, you'll know he's your relative because he's dependent on you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and so, if Enoch is the relative one, meaning dependent, having no independent existence, then what is the walk? That's a relative absolute. Hallelujah. That's what we all got here tonight. Why is it a relative absolute? Because we're approaching God. We're making an approach to God. And I'm here to tell you the good news. You haven't wholly failed. Hallelujah. Because the presence we feel is the real presence of God. Yes. Amen. I affirm that and I acknowledge his presence here at this body in Pinecrest. Not because we're named pine crust, because pine crust must decrease, but he must increase. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. This will someday not be known as a mountain of pine crust, but it'll be a, a heavenly colony of Mount Zion. Hallelujah. That's what every Christian assembly, every house church, everything that calls itself the true church must be that. Jesus Christ must be there. Or there's no life and there's no salvation. And so I delight to acknowledge his presence, that he's kept his word, where two or three of us have gathered together at least in his name. Here he is in the midst of us. All the conditions are fulfilled. We gathered in his name. He's here in the midst. And he's here to do his work, which is rather strange to the carnal mind. Hallelujah. Now what could I say about this? Almost seems like I should draw a little diagram up here. I have this, this has been working and down deep in my heart, and I don't know, I haven't written out any diagrams, but let me just put it something like this. See what I'm making here? <laughs> I'm just using a symbol of death. Here we go. <laughs> Ups and downs, see? Ups and downs, right? But always traveling upward. Here we are. We know everybody started here. 
because we're all children of the devil. We've been persuaded theologically of that. And if you live in a big American city for a while, you'll be persuaded experientially. <laughs> guns jabbed in your ribs or knives flashed at you, you'll believe it. <laughs> so Enoch is walking with God. Some great man that preached in the past said Enoch went for a walk one day and he hasn't got back yet. <laughs> but I'm going to see him one of these days. <laughs> Hallelujah. If the disciples could say that they had seen Jesus eat the honeycomb since they nailed him to the cross, hallelujah, I'm going to find out all about Elijah's development into a prophet, hallelujah. I'm going to talk with him. I'm going to walk with him, hallelujah. I'm going to say, Elijah, I don't ask for a double portion of your spirit because I come in under a better covenant and a better set of laws and light in quanta. I'm just emitting quanta of light. I know it could be made theological and put into a very classical and symmetrical form, but all I'm just, just, just giving it off. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. I don't know if I'll ever get to the point where I can give a real formal rhetorical sermon and sway the great masses of humanity. Hallelujah. Praise God. But it's in me. I just want to be delivered of this burden. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's just like bringing forth children. It's a sweet burden. Hallelujah. Because you know it's in the purpose of God and we're replenishing the earth. And by our speech and by delivering the burden of the Lord, we are peopling the kingdom of God with the seed of Abraham. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. And it will be easy one day for all of us to do miracles. For that which is perfect is coming. I say that which is perfect is coming. And the miraculous element of our lives is not going to decrease, but it's going to grow and fill all things. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the pressure that you have received has been brought to bear upon your psyche, upon your spirit, upon your nerves, has been brought to bear in order to get you moving. There isn't anything in this physical universe that if you apply enough power to it, it won't move in a certain directionality. And if one thing you notice about Enoch here, he is directionally oriented. He's moving towards God. Yeah. Hallelujah. We could put several things, Alpha and Omega or Yahweh or whatever you want to put up there. But he didn't know God any better than you know God to begin with. He was just walking with God. <coughs> he was just yielding to the divine impulse. It was like this. About 20 years ago, I was walking down the street with my cousin. He was kind of uh, cunning in a way. He had a real good mind. He's a doctor now. Walking down the sidewalk. I was walking with him down the main street of our hometown. So we were going along, and he was going like this. And this is what he was doing. You perceive what I'm doing? You perceive what I'm doing? <laughs> And you know what I was doing? I was doing the same thing. <laughs> so after we went a block or so, and he was speeding up and slowing down, and I was doing the same thing. He says, do you notice what you're doing? He said, I am impressing you. You're impressionable. He said, when I speed up, you speed up automatically. I didn't have to tell you or suggest it. You do it automatically. And when I slow down, you slow down. That's what Enoch was doing with God, or God was doing with Enoch. God was walking with Enoch and beginning to motivate the man, and he was impressing himself on him. God was beginning to make Enoch think like God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, to civilize human discourse, there is almost nothing equal to a good conversationalist. They say Dr. Ben Johnson, I believe, was the greatest conversationalist in history. If you read his conversations, they sparkle, they scintillate. They radiate with a fire of brilliance, brilliantly turned phrases and wit and puns and, and, 
and uh, the product of the human mind. Men, men vied for his company. Even if he was ins insulting them, they wanted to be with Dr. Johnson. He wrote the first English dictionary and wrote his prejudices right straight into it. You're stumbling over his prejudice even yet today. You should see his definition of a net. He even made some false definitions on purpose. And when I asked him, he admitted it and laughed about it. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he was the greatest conversationalist of all time, they say. <clears throat> And I see one reason why God took Enoch home with him. He couldn't stand to lose a good conversationalist. Hallelujah. What sweeter time have you ever had than when you sat down with a brother or sister and looked straight in their eyes and they looked straight into you? And there was no cloud. And their hearts were bare and your heart was bare. And you had that sweet kingdom fellowship and Jesus Christ was just, just in the midst. Isn't it sweet? Doesn't it say in his marvel translation how rare it is, how lovely this fellowship of them who meet together. Sweet is the oil. Hallelujah. We're partaking of the holy anointing oil tonight. He's pouring it upon us. Has a healing, calming, satisfying influence. Praise God. You know, when you're walking with somebody that's really great, you'd be just so taken up with them. Which one of your girls... Who's the great idol of the day? Who's the big heart flutter for the feminine world in the movies? <laughs> What's his name? Name one. Well, let's think of Clark Gable, the king. If he, if this were his day. And if he came and met any one of the women of his day, and they were walking down the street, I can bet that a fire truck could go by. <laughs> painted purple. <laughs> And they wouldn't even know the difference. <laughs> the earth could open up across the street and swallow up half the population. They would have eyes for, for the king. And I'll tell you, when you're walking with God, you aren't going to quite perceive what's happening to you. He has such a magnetism about him. If Jesus Christ appeared in the midst right now, I know that he would attract every eye. And I don't care if you put the greatest array of men in the world behind this pulpit and the greatest preachers, prophets, the greatest statesmen, scientists, lecturers, everybody would turn to look at Jesus. There's something about that name. Because there's something about that man. Hallelujah. His name is his character and his nature. And you know, as Enoch walked with God, he wasn't aware that he was stepping over into God's territory. He was just walking in God's sphere of influence. God walked with him in human society. Enoch walked with God in the kingdom of God. But he wasn't aware of it. Because there was no sharp line of demarcation. That's the one thing that makes spirituality puzzling. You see, there's like a balance scales in our life, carnality and spirituality. They always balance out because carnal things are heavy and spiritual things are light. So it takes an awful lot of spirituality to balance off a little bit of carnality. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's just like, how much light would it take to equal about that much of lead by weight? How much? How much does all the light in the universe weigh? Now, be careful. You might get tricked. Scientists now believe that the amount of light that was set loose when God first began to create with a gigantic creative explosion of divine mirth and hilarity, <laughs> that that amount of light actually outweighed all the mass in the universe. Mm. Hallelujah. And so when Genesis said, let there be light, there was light and how? Hallelujah. <laughs> There was nothing but blinding light and revelation everywhere, but God's being exposed by his creative word. Hallelujah. When God said, let there be light, that was the revelation of God to the then existence. Hallelujah. Or rather to the chaotic non-existence that existed, if you can put it that way. Because out of the chaotic nothingness, he brought this all. And if God can bring this whole creative, ex creative existence out of the black hole of the abyss, what can he bring out of your life? Hallelujah. Order peace and harmony and beauty. I tell you, unto you that believe on his name, in this moment all things are possible. And if there's something you desire with a burning desire, voice your desire to the Lord. There are times when God is so near and so real and so precious that literally I'm speaking the truth now. You can have whatsoever you say. Jesus said it. He said, if you'll ask and not doubt, but believe in your heart, you shall have whatsoever you say. Yes. 
I've seen that happen a few times. Hallelujah. Enoch walked with God. You see, the walk was the experience. We could, wait, quite, we could call it religion, but I don't like to use the term. So there's quotation marks around that word religion. True religion, let's put it true religion, like the great Greg Yostabaya, the true religion. <clears throat> but it's hard to tell the true from the false. Why is that? Because we all use the same language, and God gave us this revelation in the language of men. Therefore, there's a certain degree of ambiguity. What means one thing to a communist? See, the communist idea of freedom means to yield to historical necessity. And they say so historical necessity dictates that the collective proletariat is going to overwhelm the earth and all human governments and reign supreme. And the uh, communist party will become the human race. Or the international will become the human race. That's what they say. Now, we know here in the West that we're supposed to have an, an inalienable, inalienable right to happiness. You don't. If God came right now in his absoluteness and said, all right now, I'll do whatsoever you say to make you happy, you just voice it and I'll, do, I'll put the power into effect, you still wouldn't be happy because you don't know your own heart. Although I don't know my own heart. That's why you miss that place of total victory. Because when you see the tribulation, you recoil. You see the old rough badger skins, you see the place narrowing down and narrowing down and narrowing down, you just turn your back and you say, I can't pay that price. But listen, when you experience these things that seem so painful on the surface, you find that they contain within them the good and the benefit that you need. Amen. Hallelujah. I see a lot of kids at the school that won't eat liver. I see a bunch that won't eat, uh, what are some of those other things? Sorry, yeah, <laughs> quite a few things I see that won't eat it. There's probably nobody here that dislikes liver more than myself, and I eat it. I ate a lot of it the other day because I know that it's got something my body requires in abundant measure, and I eat it. I don't feel too bad about it. It gets easier all the time. <laughs> Paul Anderson is the strongest man who ever lived. He built his strength by a scientific application of developing the thighs. You see, in the old days of bodybuilding, it was never known how to attain full development. And somebody theorized back around 1910 or 20, I guess it was, Mark Berry and Alan Kelvert, I think, they said, we believe that the way to full development is by activating the ma largest masses in the body, which are the thighs. And so John Grimmett gave himself as a human guinea pig to this man's idea. Alan Calvert, I believe it was. He let them train him, and it had never been tried before. He became the first man in history to attain full development. The idea worked. Paul Anderson developed his strength by a scientific ap application of the deep knee bend or the squat. And he said this. He said, I've hated every set I ever did. Why? Because it's the hardest work that a man can do. Since it activates the largest mass of muscle, it most vigorously stimulates the heart and lungs. That's why I'm not a lot bigger tonight, because I always favored arm development, and so I never got as big as I could have. I started out pretty small anyway. But I could have been made into a superman if I would have yielded myself to the true scientific knowledge, but I was rebellious. I wouldn't do it. But of course, that's, n that's neither here nor there. That's a secondary. That's not important. I'm just telling you something. I'm telling you that God has spiritual exercise with you that will develop you into God's superman. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, don't think of the e ego elevator shooting up into infinity where you're going to be a, a, the, great, the great I will. Our, our problem is right now, you see, Satan said, I will. Now, here's a problem. You see, God is a lot like the sun. He radiates light. He radiates light in all directions. Backward in time, forward into the future, through the entire present. You know, there's light in the earth tonight. Can we thank God that there is a degree of light and revelation that there is? A restoration process beginning with Luther and before that has proceeded to our very generation. And what do we think about all the time? The tribulation, the tribulation, the tribulation, the tribulation. We think we're having tribulation and corned beef every night for dinner. <laughs> Do you ever consider the sweet fruits of that? Yes. How good it is. I thought I was going to die, and I did die at General Motors. And one night, God spoke to me a few months ago up there. He said, that's the most valuable experience you ever had. And the manifest presence of God was radiating upon me. I wouldn't have believed it. I hear lots of voices, but I don't believe the voice unless the presence of God manifests along with it. Hallelujah.
The air is full of voices, more than ever before in history. And the Bible says, Beloved, be they not every voice. Spirit is translatable as voice there. Because what good is being a spirit if you can't talk? And that's an attribute of all spirits. They speak. Right. Hallelujah. And you'll find out that all the speaking to church doesn't come from the same spirit because it doesn't always produce blessing and peace and life and holiness. By their fruits ye shall know them. Amen. Hallelujah. So here is this Christian, or this man, Enoch, whoever it might be, coming up the stairs of progressive revelation, progressive experience. Here we have the absolute, here we have the, I don't know what you call it, chaos, destruction, death, Satan. You can name it a lot of different things, but it's the very thing we don't want. It's the thing that poses cancers in our body and fear and torment in our minds. It's the thing we want to flee from. So the blessed thing about salvation is when you meet him and you begin to walk with him, he orients you in one direction and one only. Hallelujah. Yes. So here we have fire of God. We represent him as a flaming orb, as a sphere of light, giving off light in all directions. And here comes the light. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Did you ever get hit with a ray of light in God and it almost knocked you down, and yet it has no mass and no measurement? Hallelujah. And it can't register itself on any scientific instrument. And yet when God's revelation light hits you, it almost floors you sometime. Yeah. Hallelujah. You're standing there in a black hole, and your life is stymied and stultified, and you're flummoxed, and you're flabbergasted, and you say, God, what am I going to do? All I'm conscious of is I'm up against a mountain, a stone wall of impossibility, and when the light of God hits you, hallelujah, you know where to pick your foot up and set it down for the next step. That's what it does, hallelujah. Every step he took was in the revelation light of God's presence. That's why he finally got where he is, hallelujah. That's why he ceased to be. Because he laid down his life as a living soul and he took it up again as a quickening spirit. Hallelujah. He was translated from the ratio of carnality to spirituality to his all spirituality. Hallelujah. And he remains it for us as a quintessential example of having the testimony that we please God. What pleases God that we walk with him? That we go where he wants us to go and we do what he wants us to do and say what he wants us to say. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he would condescend and qualify himself that far from the absolute. That he would dwell in us and walk in us and walk with us through this life. That we might see what it's like to be the sons of God, the children of God, the very offspring of deity. That which partakes of his absoluteness. Hallelujah. And this walk of the Christian here is a relative absolute because it, it has some of the old, but bless God, it has partaken of God and has some of his absoluteness about it. What does that mean? That means if you're abiding and if you're walking with him and you retain that orientation of direction which is towards him. You see, Jesus said he set his face like a flint. Like an adamant stone, as hard as a diamond was his will and decision to only do those things that please the Father. Where shall I find this? I'm trying to think of a certain scripture I want right now. I, picked, I brought certain translations here for a purpose. Listen to what it says here. Now I'm bringing up the idea of religious people and their light becoming darkness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And here's what it says in James, the first chapter. Make no mistake about this, my beloved brothers, because they were reasoning about these things we're discussing tonight in this general area. All we are given is good, and all our endowments are faultless, descending from above, from the Father of the heavenly lights. You see, his offspring are other heavenly lights. It's like the sun and the moon and the stars, as though the sun were the Father and the moon were the Holy Ghost and the stars were the sons of God. <coughs> Hallelujah. Didn't Job say in that day the, the sons of God sang for joy? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As the star is in the universe, so are God's children in the moral and spiritual universe of human society and of this cosmos. Hallelujah. We're the only source of light. Yeah. Manif Christ manifested in us as the only source of light. Yeah. Make no mistake. It's not religious institutions. They're part of the problem. 
when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, he says, come forth, Lazarus, showing that he can resurrect those that are in spiritual cemeteries, religious organizations. But when he came forth, he came forth totally by the power of God. He had to unwrap it and take the grave clothes off. Those are the religious traditions that would bind the new creation of man after he's been made alive in Christ. Hallelujah. I'd like to be unwrapped, wouldn't you? Amen. I'd like to feel this full atmosphere of the kingdom. Hallelujah. And so, all of our endowments descend from the Father of the heavenly lights who knows no change of rising and setting, who casts no shadow on the earth. Now listen to what Jesus says in Matthew. I'm going to read a little bit, Matthew 6 and 19, out of Moffat's translation again. I seek a scripture, I try to get sense out of it, meaning and understanding, as much as possible, and this really spoke <coughs> to me tonight. Jesus said, store up no treasures for yourselves on earth, where moth and rust corrode, where thieves break in and steal, Store up treasures for yourselves in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrode, where thieves do not break in and steal. <clears throat> but where your treasure lies, your heart will lie there too. Hallelujah. And if he is your treasure, hallelujah. If he is your treasure, glory to God. That's where you're going to constantly be looking to. All the lines of yearning from your heart and your inner being are going to be radiating towards Him. <coughs> Hallelujah. And naturally, if your gaze is upon Him, His light, His full light of the kingdom day is going to be falling squarely on you. Yes. In His light shall we see light. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. And the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There it is, the path of the just, represented by a series of revelation experiences, a series of crises, a series of ups and downs, but always ascending. Just like from here, if you go to Mount Marcy, you'll make a lot of ups and downs, but you'll continually be ascending to 5,344 feet above sea level. I'd like to get a group up there next summer and pray on the top of Mount Marcy. Amen. Hallelujah. And let the word of the Lord loosen the atmosphere of the earth. Hallelujah. Creative word. Little do you realize the power that's in your power of speech. You know what the gift of tongues illustrates or represents? Word power. Hallelujah. Power with God and power with men. And so Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is generous, the whole of your body will be illumined. Now this is the way Moffat renders it, and he was a linguistic genius. That's not quibble. But if your eye is selfish, the whole of your body will be darkened. Mm -hmm. And if your very light turns dark, then what a darkness it is. Yeah. Jesus speaking with an exclamation mark. What a darkness it is mm -hmm. if your light turns dark. Now see, I, I suggested the possibility that light can turn to darkness. Jesus says so, bluntly. Right. Light can turn to darkness. How does light turn to darkness? <clears throat> well, it's impossible in this natural environment of the earth to experience total darkness. You could be in a dense hemlock forest at midnight and you, there'd still be some light. In fact, when the great optical companies tried to make a perfect lens or optical device, their one great problem was getting the inside blackened. Now at Carl Zeiss Optical, they made a perfectly black hole and the way they did it, contrary to the thoughts of people who know about optics, instead of using black flocking or dead black, they painted it in a black, glossy black and they got the darkest, blackest possible hole that could be devised by the mind of man at Carl Zeiss Optical, which is the world's biggest optical company. So, you can't get a total darkness. And there's a reason for that. Because Earth has an atmosphere. Have you ever wondered why the sky is blue? How many in here know why the sky is blue? Put your hands up. You know, you know. So there's about half a dozen or ten or so. Well, the reason the sky is blue is because the particles that make up the atmosphere, the average particle, has a diameter that coincides with the wavelength of blue light, and so it scatters blue light. 
And the reason the earth or human societies go on is because there are Christians on the earth and they scatter heavenly light. They're tuned to the wavelength of the heavenly blue. Hallelujah. You see, now the natural earth has a, a blue haze enveloping it because the particles are scattering that wavelength only. And the moral and spiritual universe made up of the visible and invisible nations and kingdoms of this earth. I'm talking about the angelic rulers and all of this put together. There is still light and moral truth and moral certainty because there are true people of God scattering and radiating this heavenly light. Hallelujah. Do you follow me? But the Bible shows us and history indicates that we're aiming ourselves toward a moral and spiritual vacuum. Now, if you're in a vacuum, there'd be no more scattering of light. And here's the way light turns into darkness. This being, this man who is aiming toward God, you see, just making a representation, he's got his orientation this way. Now, if he were existing in a moral, spiritual vacuum, which in a sense we do because we're all individuals, if his orientation changes this way, you see what's going to happen? He will be aware of total blackness because there's nothing else in his that he can relate to that's radiating back to him the heavenly light. Do you follow me? Yes. Now let's picture that we could go into outer space somewhere where there's a very, very thin vacuum. And if you could stand in space without exploding, if you could be in, a, say, a self-contained atmosphere, you look at the sun, it would blind you and burn up your, the corneas of your eyes. But if you could have a, <clears throat> perhaps a 99% light filter, a black glass here, and you could look at the sun, and then you could turn yourself around 180 degrees and look into outer space where there was no star or no burning body, you would see total blackness because the light would be striking on your back, but you would not be aware of any light. There'd be no atmosphere to radiate or diffuse or scatter the light. You see? Now here's why a religious body of people can be born in a dr true historic divine visitation. I don't care what you name it or what the doctrine was that became prominent or what God restored at that time, they've got their light, and their light is only light as long as their orientation is towards Him and until they have the Lord Jesus Christ in their gaze. But immediately they turn away from the Lord Jesus Christ, they turn into total blackness, morally and spiritually. But that does not horrify men and women because we live in a natural world, and so we have the light and the experience of the five natural senses to pacify us. That's what happened to Adam. Adam went from a state of being where he had t perfect fellowship with God and he walked with God and he saw the light of God and could receive the perfect communication of the Father's uh, desire in his heart. And he was clothed in garments of light. But when Adam sinned, those garments of light fell from him into the earth and were drawn back unto the Lord. And Adam and Eve knew that they were naked, and they knew that somehow the world had changed, and they knew that they were dead, and that they no longer had that open channel to God. No more would they walk with God in the cool of the day and talk with Him. And they hear the words that only God can speak, giving life and health to your bones and strength to your every impulse and to you cannot fail, hallelujah, for the Father has begotten his sons for success. Yes. He wants you to be successful. I'm not going to go into defining success, <clears throat> but do you perceive why your light can turn to darkness? Why is it? Because you're looking at him and then when a selfish impulse comes in, you look at yourself and immediately look at yourself. You've taken your eyes out of the stream of light. This is what came in and upset the entire universal harmony. Was when the eye will of Lucifer barged in and began to elbow the I am of God. We've got to deal with that I will. We've got to find out that our will is harmonized with his will. And if it is, and if he tells you to go and pray for Sister Jones, that she be healed of cancer, you'll go and she will be healed of cancer. For everything in this universe will hasten to submit itself to the divine fiat, the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. For all creation recognizes the voice of authority. 
Why did he bring so many terminal cancer patients to William Branham? Because he had such a clear channel. He could speak the word of the Lord, and many, 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 many that were dying were healed right in his meetings. I've seen cancers that were dying healed already in some of those meetings. I've seen their face change from a sickly greenish white to a rosy pink in a matter of minutes as the power of God was operating and functioning in their bodies. Hallelujah. There is no end to what can be done. Simply no end. Hallelujah. And so as you're ascending upward into the consciousness of the divine, you have your relative absolute, which is your walk with God. And as you go, it becomes less and less relative and more and more absolute because you become related more and more to God. <coughs> Hallelujah. And you might come to the point where you'll be like, well, let's talk a little bit just about this problem of, uh, I'm considering now Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11 talking about this thing called tribulation. What does tribulation have to do, to do with it? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us a lot about Enoch's tribulations, but I can't picture anybody walking with God in any age without any tribulations. So I'm not exactly sure which one of these versions I'd like to read. But the test of time is a thing that defeats the Christian, you know. But remember, a thousand years is with the Lord as one day, and one year, day is with as a thousand years. So God isn't letting time hinder him any. See, God is waiting that he might be gracious. And what it tells about here, well, it tells us simply this. It tells us that this present discipline, which is tribulation, or the things that Jesus experienced painfully, which things turned out to be good, because that's the meaning of the word, intrinsically good. It's like this. It says, for the time being. You see, time is what defeats you. I realize now that the greatest test that I have had to face in my life up until now has been the test of time. That I heard a word from the Lord years ago saying he would do so and so, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and then you become tempted. And this is exactly what this walk is. It's temptation. Because to be between God and Satan, that is temptation, and to be torn. You've heard the word of the Lord, and you feel an inner urge. After so many weeks or months or years go by, you say, well, I guess it isn't going to happen. I want to turn back. That's how the Lord is testing you for your fitness for the kingdom. He's qualifying you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. In fact, that's the very word that's used here in Hebrews. Listen to what it says about Jesus here. Uh, although he was a son, he learned from what he suffered how to... Although he was a son, he learned from what he suffered how to obey, and because he was perfectly qualified for it, hallelujah, he was perfectly qualified for it. His relationship to God was proper in all points. And the Bible makes much a temptation for it. It says, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Yeah. That talks about a lifetime of temptation. The temptation in the wilderness was just a representative thing of that which would take place all through his life in the three departments of our being. Hallelujah. Because he was perfectly qualified for it, he became the author of endless salvation for all who obey him, since he had received from God the title of a high priest with the rank of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. So Jesus never let time trouble him or defeat him or overcome him because he was the ancient of days in human flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And everyone that's born of God has the quality, at least some of the quality, of the Ancient of Days. And you've got patience in you. And tribulation works patience. Hallelujah. Amen. The tribulation only brings out what is already there. It doesn't produce it out of nothing. It doesn't impose it upon you like a mantle. But it, it draws forth that which is in the divine seed of the Word of God and begins to develop in the nature and the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, for the time being, for the time being, no discipline seems to be pleasant. And so we let tribulation seem to be something and face us down and turn us off. And so we turn aside and we don't go through the experience God had for us, that which would turn out to be good. It says here it's painful. Later on, however, to those who are trained by it, it yields the fruit of peace, which grows from upright character. That, and, and, uh, and the Phillips translation says, if we receive it in the right attitude, 
I'll tell you, the greatest thing we could do tonight is to embrace our circumstances and just praise God for it with all Hallelujah. our might. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your praise will transform your attitude. Yes. Because the presence of God will come. He says that the God of Israel inhabits the praises of his people. Doesn't it say that? Yeah. And so if you put him up a tabernacle of praise, he'll put you up a tabernacle of the presence of God. And in the presence of God, as you're interpenetrated by his very substance, it will change you from within. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. And so, as you go on with God, you become more and more stable, and you're better able to attack the problems, better able to plunge into the forbidding-looking tribulation. Listen, Peter saw the waves of the sea. It was a state of, of aquatic tribulation, you might say. But Peter, at the word of Jesus, and with the confidence he had in his character and in his person, Peter said, if it's you, Lord, bid me to come on you. And he stepped over the gunwale of the boat in faith and confidence. Hallelujah. And what is developing as you ascend in God? Your confidence is developing until Elijah could stand on Mount Carmel and pray the most confident prayer of the Old Testament and say, God, send some fire down out of the heavens. Hallelujah. And ignite the sacrifice. And show the line, your prophet, and I have done all this at your word. The Bible says you have magnified your, name, your word above all your name. Hallelujah. If you'll be patient and hold to the word of the Lord, you'll see a fulfillment. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 32. It talks to me about what Paul saw on the Damascus road. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. That's what Paul saw when he saw a light brighter than the sun at noonday. He saw the King Jesus reigning in righteousness. And princes shall rule in judgment. Hallelujah. Those are the other sons he's bringing unto glory. And the Bible talks about you who are stable here. Listen in verse 2. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. You know, we live in a weary land. 20th century America is the wasteland. And Western Europe is a wasteland. And Soviet Russia and China and every Soviet socialist republic is a wasteland because they are based on a materialistic premise that this thing that I can lay hands on is all there is. Mm -hmm. There's no God behind this veil of solid materiality. It's like a desert. It's a moral and spiritual universe that's lost its atmosphere. For the atmosphere of man is the presence of God, and we live and breathe and move and have our being in Him yes. and through Him. Have you noticed something about the American system that our law doesn't work the way it used to? Do you know why? Because there's some of the absolute of God in our law through the Scripture, and our people have become unrelated to God, therefore the law doesn't work like it used to, and they can't enforce it anymore. You see, Paul says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. But if it ceases to be in Christ Jesus, like it was with some of the sons of God or earth, then it will no longer set you free from the law of sin and death. And it will fail. It will give way under your feet. Because it all depends on relationship. Enoch walked with God, and with is the word of relationship there. It means in the company with. It means that a mutual relationship, that Enoch was looking at God and God was looking at Enoch, and they were arm in arm, and they were taking a stroll together, hallelujah, in God's sphere of influence, which is the kingdom of God. And so what we are left with, now that they have brushed away the moral law and denied the word of God and denied the person of God and officially denied it in Russia, the first nation in history that officially denied the existence of God and denied it to the UN where it's not even legal to pray before a session and America is there in harmony in relationship with that. What we're left with is a relativistic universe with what we call a new, th a new morality. I call it the no morality. Because it leaves you related to nothing. You can't get your hands on an absolute. You can't feel solid rock under your feet if you're, if you're in that generation and if you live and think and believe that way. And everywhere you go, you're confronted by the changing, shifting uh, aspect of a, a desert full of sand dunes that the winds of change are continually blowing and driving. And what a man looks for in such a situation is a rock. Men are looking for you. Women are looking for you because if you have some of God's unshakableness, unchangeableness, that ever shining of the grace of God in your life, they will seek you out for a hiding place from the wind. 
The winds of revolution that are whipping over the earth and are going to tear down every great city in America eventually with the flames of atomic fire. Hallelujah. A covered from the tempest, rivers of water in a, dry, in a dry place, and as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land, they will seek you out. You will be the landmark in your community or wherever you live. The unchanging word and promise of God, the counsel of the Spirit of God will be in you, and men will seek you out, and they will ask, what says the Lord? What is the word of the Lord? What do you advise me to do? And, and the word of the Lord will be in your mouth, and it will be sweet as honey. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just suggesting. Just making a suggestion. Hallelujah. In his light shall we see light. If you look toward darkness, you'll see nothing but darkness. Don't wonder, if you'd ever turn away from Jesus, that your life is an endless spiral down into a big black hole. Don't wonder, and it goes on forever. Just as God is infinite on the positive side, so the negative answers symmetrically to him. Hallelujah. It's like two sides of belief. All nature is like it. This is the way a maple leaf is seen like this. Hallelujah. Bilaterally symmetrical. The mirror image of the good and the evil. Matter and antimatter. God and Satan. Life and death. Hallelujah. Choose you this day whom you shall serve. Hallelujah. Make your decision whom you will look at and gaze at and behold for the rest of eternity. Amen. Yes. You want to open up your eyes in hell and look into the leering faces of devils and to have the archfiend mock you? Or do you want to look at Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. For the joy that was set before him, he set his face like a flint toward the cross, and he despised the shame. He waited out in the balance with the glory that would be revealed, and he counted as nothing. <coughs> Hallelujah. He endured the cross. He sat down at the right hand of God. He's making intercession for you and me. Not a one of you have an insoluble problem in here tonight. The things that have been bugging you and hammering at you and tearing you down are going to melt away in the gaze of the sunlight of his love and grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we prayed Sunday night, five or six or eight people, I forget how many. I felt the presence of God mightily, and I know those people got something in God. Is that right? Hallelujah. When we prayed for that sister back there, I felt a tremendous manifestation of his presence, and I knew and something has happened. And when that young man came that was a friend of Ed's for the first time, I felt the presence of God stronger than I felt him in a long time. And I know that he, he met the Lord. He got something from God. Hallelujah. When we pray for a whole bunch, they don't all get something. But praise God for the ones that do. It's worth it all. Because their lives are changed for good. Hallelujah. Every one of us, he's made us into a new man and new women. And he's still changing us. And he will continue to change. Hallelujah. God bless you.